Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I would just like to ask everyone to turn off their cell phones or any other electronic devices as we are recording this. Good morning. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you all for beginning your day with us. Our speaker this morning is a prize-winning historian and religious scholar, Barry Wills. Today he will be discussing his latest book entitled, What the Quran Meant and Why It Matters. It is an invitation to all non-Muslims to engage in a conversation about politics and religion in the 21st century. Today it is accepted that the Quran is the embodiment of God's word. For 1.6 billion, it is their Bible. They live by the book. Muslims try to memorize it, quote it against each other, as well as against the outside world. It is held so sacred that a host of fastidious traditions adhere to it. For example, it must be placed at the top of any pile of books. It must be held above the waist. For a long time, most Americans did not have to know much about Islam. That is no longer the case. We entered into the longest war in our history without knowing basic facts about the Islamic civilization with which we were dealing. We are constantly fed information about Islam, claims that it is essentially a religion of violence, that its sacred book is a handbook for terrorists. There is no way to assess the veracity of these claims unless we have at least some knowledge of the Quran. As a first step in expanding our understanding about a religion that captures the hearts and minds of 23% of the world's population, it is my pleasure to welcome one of our country's leading public intellectuals to this forum. Barry Wills, thank you so much for joining us. I want to begin the conversation by asking you, um, when people think of you, Gary Wills, more often than not, they associate your name not only with your wonderful writing on seminal political events in American history, but also with your widely acclaimed scholarship in Christianity. So the question is, most of us are wondering why you decided to write about the Quran now. Shame. After 9-11, when we were told that the Muslims had caused that catastrophe. I was talking with a group of academic friends, and they said, well, how much of this really comes from the Quran? And it turned out that none of us, though we were all pretty well educated and intellectually curious, none of us had read the Quran. One of the people said, not you, Gary, I thought you were a religious scholar. And she should have asked that because it was stupid of me not to have. But I tried to remedy that. And, and when I kept asking people, uh, have you read the Quran? I was amazed at how few had, even people who were doing religious studies or political studies. And it turns out, of course, that for the purposes of agitators, it's, it's good that you have not read the Quran because they tell you what's in it, and it isn't. So I started exploring that uh, and giving some lectures and continuing to ask people, even those who had claimed they had read it, it was very hard, a different kind of scripture. And there was a whole lot of that out there. So I more and more started worrying about a world in which we engage uh, with Muslims around the world without knowing, really, what they think. That made us credulous when wild statements were advanced about the Quran and about Islam. Donald Trump on campaign told Anderson Cooper, Islam hates us. That's a pretty sweeping indictment of 1.8 billion people in the world. Uh, and he was asked uh, in later interviews, do you want to qualify that statement at all? He said, no. I stand by it exactly, and there's just a whole lot of hatred out there for us. We're, we're hated everywhere in the world. Uh, 
And, but that's certainly true that some terrorists who are formerly Muslim hate us. The vast majority don't. The vast majority are peaceful. Uh, they live lives of service to whatever community they're in. We in America have Muslim policemen, Muslim soldiers, Muslim doctors uh, who don't hate us, obviously. Kizra Khan, his son died fighting for America. Uh, and Trump attacked the father of Kizra Khan and his wife, saying, oh, religion makes her, wrote a column saying, children cannot be taught the Quran. It makes them terrorists. Uh, this is so wildly untrue that I thought I'd better try to fight it in some way. On reading the Quran, what intrigued you the most? Well, what surprised me, a lot of things surprised me. What was not in it uh, surprised me. But what was in it especially surprised me. It's a very inclusive religion, more inclusive than uh, Judaism or Christianity. Judaism has its chosen people, the circumcised. Christianity has its chosen people, the baptized. The chosen people of the Quran are all monotheists, any of them. Uh, from Adam on, there's an unceasing stream of prophets, beginning with Adam, coming down through Isaiah, Abraham, Moses, uh, Jesus, John the Baptist, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's uh, pagan polytheists. Monotheism versus polytheism is the issue throughout the Quran. And the, what Allah tells him is that he drew up the Hebrew covenant. Uh, under the, the, the title for him of Yahweh. He drew up, he drew up the New Testament covenant uh, under the name of Jesus' father. And of course, he grew up the, the Muslim covenant uh, under the name of Allah. But it's all one God. There's, there's no other God. Uh, and he said, so it's the duty of all these people to love and respect each other, because they have the same covenant from the same God, and to protect their places of worship. He tells the, the uh, followers of Muhammad that they must protect uh, synagogues and churches. And those uh, monotheists must protect mosques. You never hear this. absolutely the most striking uh, thing. He said, there cannot be argument among the followers of God uh, because he drew up all of these covenants and they're all equal. And now, that certainly goes against what a number of people have believed and taught and, and created great hatred out of with uh, uh, Trump's saying. So that was that was pretty surprising. So why do you think it is, especially by politicians well, and pundits? Uh, there are a few passages which you can equate with the whole Quran that are disturbing to us. Uh, the, but the, people rely on just one or two passages, especially the so-called sword verse in the Quran in which he says, after four months, lie in wait for them. Uh, uh, go to war with them, them being polytheists. And you can make a, a great case that this is a savage, savage bit of advice. And nobody who uh, promotes that interpretation pays attention to the first words, after four months. Why after four months? There's a whole context uh, in the ninth surah of religious truths. Religious truths 
was a common feature then. It's like the peace of God in medieval Christianity, in which around the sacred places, especially the Kaaba, uh, people agree there will be no fighting. Uh, and so there was a truce for four months in which there will be no fighting. But during that time, the polytheists attacked the Muslims. And uh, Allah, through Muhammad, said, don't fight. Don't, you keep the truce, even if they don't. But after the truce, after four months, lie in wait for the ones who have attacked you and kill them, unless they surrender. Uh, but main thing is to have mercy the minute anybody says, uh, we're sorry, we shouldn't have attacked you, etc. Whole, that whole chapter uh, is the explanation for that one violent thing. And it has been, by excerpting that one uh, entry, uh, it has lived on as the sword verse. Sword's not mentioned there or anywhere in the Quran. Uh, that's just projection of our ideas about warfare. Uh, and, for, and the other thing that people make a great deal of is the uh, misogyny of the Quran. There's no question it's misogynist. Uh, women were second-class citizens citizens, uh, well, no, they weren't citizens, uh, as they were everywhere in the seventh century uh, for most of history. Uh, it's a lot easier to get misogynist out of the Old Testament than out of the uh, Quran. There's one, uh, the equivalent of the sword verse for war is that, is, is that with the word jihad? Do you find jihad in that? Uh, jihad doesn't mean a holy war. Again, there's no word of holy war in the Quran. Uh, jihad is zeal. Uh, and it, you can be uh, waging jihad against your own imperfections. You should always wage jihad in promoting Allah, uh, the one God. Uh, but the idea that that is a war form of war is, is totally false. Uh, what they concentrate on for women is the one section where he says, if you're trying to correct a woman, a wife, uh, instruct her. And if she doesn't pay attention, abstain from her bed. Uh, and if she still doesn't pay attention to what Allah has told you, uh, strike her. Uh, now, striking women was a very common thing in all society then. But uh, the important thing, the interesting thing is, I wondered, what it, why abstain from her bed? You know, the, the uh, sex strike... It's usually what women go on from the time of Aristophanes. Uh, why, why was that a step in correction? Well, the main thing we have to remember is, is that uh, multiple wives were the norm then, as in the time of Solomon and David and Mormons. Uh, uh, and by withdrawing from her bed in a controlled harem situation, you're depriving her of certain privilege in her company and of the, of the chance of breeding an heir for you. Uh, so you have to understand uh, the society that she's talking in, and it's not wild or strained uh, if you do. The other, the other thing that's interesting is that though it was uh, polygamous, not Guinness, not polygamous, that is, own multiple wives. Not, not, of course, not all multiple husbands. It's never been that. Uh, but 
the wives in the, those marriages uh, had to consent to be married to you. Uh, they were not forced. They were not ordered to. Uh, moreover, they came with their own property. It was a very different dowry system from the one we're familiar with in Christian Middle Ages. The Christian dowry was the father gave to the family of the bride-to-be uh, a dowry which her family disposed of. Uh, in the Muslim marriage, the, the dowry is given to the bride, and she keeps it as a separate fund for herself. So uh, there's a kind of competition of ownership among the wives, and they can take their dowry away with them after the divorce. Uh, and as feminist Muslims, and there are feminist Muslims, point out, if a man tried to beat you up too much, you could just leave. You could take your dowry. And that was a way of, re of restraining him. If he wanted to keep that dowry in his operating system, although particularly hers all along, he's her. Uh, so it's a, it's a complex, totally different world, both for the bad and for the good, from the one that we have been accustomed, I have been accustomed to. Uh, and it involves great ignorance of the Quran to say these kinds of things about it's a woman-hating uh, scripture, uh, certainly not more so than the multiple wives of uh, David and Solomon, in which the wives didn't have dowry rights and couldn't initiate divorce. So, as Mormons have given up polygyny, uh, so mo modern Muslims have given up polygyny. That is, uh, very little recognition of the right to have more than one wife. Uh, and even then, the Quran limited the number of wives that most people could have. It made an exception for Muhammad, hoping that he would produce an heir, male heir, but he didn't. That's what caused the split of Shia and Sunni. Uh, nobody knew exactly who was the closest representative and heir to Muhammad. So they fought over that. And it, the fight led to a long history of different readings of the law, different interpreters, different judges, uh, with a whole, each having a whole body of scholarship for their uh, in, in inheriting the legacy of Muhammad. Uh, anyway, those are some of the things that intrigued me, and, and I found when I would present this ju just to friends, they would doubt her. Allah says, all your covenants are equal. I, I don't send mixed messages. All the prophets are my prophets, including Jesus, including Moses, including Adam. Uh, Adam, you know, there are great parallels between the Old Testament and the, and the Quran. But Adam, in uh, the Christian view, uh, creates this terrible sin and gets cursed. Uh, and then disappears from the history. And it's only in legend does it say that Jesus in the harrowing of hell went down and pulled Adam out of uh, limbo or whatever he was stored in until the final days. Uh, but Adam repents and is forgiven in the Quran, and he becomes uh, the first prophet. Uh, so the, God says, Allah says, uh, I have never ceased sending prophets, messengers, uh, warners, uh, different words, uh, at any point in history. Why would I st stop talking to my creation? Uh, we, the, the human is 
uh, Allah's proudest boast. In fact, he tells Satan to kneel down to Adam when he first creates him. And Satan refuses. He says, why should I kneel to him? You, you made him out of earth. You made me out of fire. And Allah says, you have to have reverence for what I have made. And when he refuses, that is what condemns him to hell. Hell is really uh, even more present in the Quran than in the New Testament. Uh, it's not really present at all in the Old Testament. Uh, but the fallen Satan sends a number of his people around the world to fight Allah through the, uh, and to try to baffle the work of the prophets. But uh, this great struggle that goes on, when he says you should fall down in reverence Adam, he also says you should fall down in reverence my earthly creations. Mountains. Allah loves mountains, but especially he loves water. Because uh, he's water, in the desert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, water is sacred uh, in the Quran. In fact, modern ecologists could do well uh, paying attention to the dialogue with nature that, that Allah has and that he tells his followers to have. Uh, these are things that were great marvels of mine when I made them. Sounds like the book of Job, you know. <laughs> were you there when I did this and this and this and this, that you would question me? Uh, so uh, these things give such a different slant to reading the book. You, you might ask, why did Pope Francis say uh, the Quran is a peaceful spiritual book from which Christians can learn how to be devout. Uh, it said that in the joy of the gospel. Uh, that's not what people first of all conceive of the book as. Obviously most Muslims are spiritually fed by this document. They, it is their uh, only good expression of love of God. Uh, and the dialogue that it sets up with nature, for instance. Allah says to Muhammad, David prophesied, but so did the mountain. Uh, Muhammad, uh, uh, Moses prophesied, but so did the mountain. They collaborated uh, in prophesying, that is, spreading the word of my greatness, of God's greatness. Uh, there's a constant communication with creatures. And he, ha he also has those things responding to God. The mountain worships God. Uh, even the ants worship God. Uh, it's like, for me, it's like Augustine saying, everything God made is good. We, we screwed it up. But he said, I, I could dis discant in all candor on the glories of the worm. It's perfect rotundity, how everything in it works for unity from one end to end. Uh, it's natural colors, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of hymn to creation is all through the Quran. Before we go to questions, I was just wondering, is there something that was most striking to you um, in recognition for you as a Catholic in reading the Quran, what stood out to you the most, or what would be the message? Well, that I've already mentioned it. Inclusiveness. Inclusive. The Quran really wants to have all God's people cooperate together. And you shouldn't think that they have different gods. There's only one God. And when he speaks, he also boasts of the fact that I, I get my message out by in the language of the receiver. That is, I spoke Hebrew when I uh, struck up the covenant with the Jews. I spoke Greek when I struck up the covenant with the Christians. I spoke Arabic when I struck up the covenant with you, 
you'll have it. Uh, that is the most striking thing. It most differentiates this from other sacred writings. Uh, later on, people will try to be ecumenical about uh, their, not their, quote, rival religions. Uh, for a long time, when I was young, we were forbidden to go into any non-Catholic church or any synagogue. Uh, that was countenancing error. Uh, they were wrong, and we shouldn't encourage them by even respecting them. Uh, or respecting That's gone in the Quran. Uh, since God is, as I said, the only, the only people who are outside the covenant uh, wouldn't be atheists if there were any around. It was not a, not a subject that was up, so it's never mentioned in the Quran. What he goes after is the idolaters, the ones worshiping different gods. Uh, and he's like uh, Yahweh, who says, uh, I'm your God, you can't have rival gods to me. No other god. Well, that's, that's the uh, trait of the Quran, too. Since we don't have nearly as many polytheists around, uh, idolaters is a word for them, of course, each separate god having uh, their own identity. And, of course, that was very real to uh, Muhammad. According to the history that Allah reveals to Muhammad, the Kaaba, the, the great uh, holy place, was originally uh, built, well, first of all, it was built before the flood. Then the flood wiped it out. And then Abraham uh, built the Kaaba. Uh, and, but then polytheists came in. And Mecca is a caravanserai stop. Uh, the caravans of goods going in and out of, of Mecca is very strong. Another thing is about the Quran is it's a very commercial document. You know, it's also against uh, usury. Uh, it says you have to strike fair bargains in your business dealings. That was very personal to Muhammad because the woman he first married uh, was a rich merchant. Uh, and she had him take over the business and run it until she died. Uh, so he's saying, be very upright in your dealings, because as in a great merchandising center, take uh, Venice of Shakespeare's play, these ships are going out and coming back, and uh, you're broke or not, according to wh what they deliver. Uh, and, of course, the Jew is attacked for usury because he doesn't trade fair on these exchanges. Well, that's all forbidden in the Quran. Uh, and as I said, women can, they, they can inherit as well as uh, be given a dowry. Now, it's, it's true that they inherit only half of what a male heir will inherit. Nonetheless, they do inherit. It is property that they own, uh, and that's almost unheard of at that time. Where does Sharia law fit into all this? Pardon? Sharia law. You know, we, oh, we, uh, Sharia law is, not men is mentioned only once in the Quran. Sharia means path. Uh, and at one point, uh, Allah has to keep reassuring Muhammad that even though he's being denied by the polytheists, uh, he must deliver the message. And of course, uh, that's what the Jewish prophets find out. They're, they're all going to deny me. They're going to kill me. They're going to do that. And God says, go ahead, go ahead, deliver my message. Uh, now, the only time that uh, Sharia is mentioned in the Quran, he, he says to 
Muhammad to, to buck him up, as, as he often does. Uh, he said, follow the, the Sharia, the right path, no matter what. Uh, now, the whole history of Sharia later on was people uh, developing or distorting things that Muhammad had set up. As I say, there were the two, two different uh, interpretations of the inheritance, Shia and Sunni, and they all developed their, they both developed their laws, uh, their history, and to them, Sharia, the right path, uh, became much more a codified legal stuff. Uh, it's very like the development of the New Testament into medieval canon law. None of that is really in the New Testament, uh, but it becomes very, a, a great source of authority and controversy. Uh, the whole scholastic uh, splitting of hairs approach to religion, which offended many people, uh, the reformers in Christianity especially, that go back to the New Testament and stop all this quibbling about what a Christian can and can't do and must do, et cetera, et cetera. So Sharia law, there, that, that developed out of those rival uh, inheritances, and it became very specialized. There are thousands of provisions of Sharia law. There's not one body. Uh, it's, uh, it depends on where you are in the world. Uh, so the idea that a, a number, dozens of American states have legislated or tried to legislate. We won't let Sharia law into our government. It's very hard to know what they mean by that. None of them seem to have great uh, learning about what Sharia is now or in the past. And I wonder how a, that Sharia law does try to creep into our legal system, uh, which it doesn't. Uh, and a lot of people just equate Sharia law with the Islamic people who behead American, uh, uh, behead people around the world. Uh, that's the shorthand for Sharia law in many people's minds. It couldn't be farther from either historical developments or the original uh, Quran. I thank you for beginning this interreligious dialogue, and I'm sure we have many questions in the audience. So um, I just ask that you wait until the microphone comes to you and um, introduce yourself. So we'll start over here. Susan? Susan, get off the Thank you for bringing real religion into our lives this morning. But the question is, because we also have to deal with politics and with the world as we know it, how can this message be carried? Now, you mentioned Pope Francis, and there are many Catholics. So uh, instead of people misinterpreting and killing each other on the basis of their own interpretations, how can you, how can we, uh, certainly the Carnegie Council is, is a bastion, um, bring rationality and understanding about the Quran and about Islam? Well, the place to begin is read the Quran. How many of you have read the Quran? One, two, three, four. And there's a couple on the Five, day. six, seven. Uh, well, you're a much better uh, uh, religious knowledge than most of the people that I talk to. And you'll see, seven is, I, I, messed, I missed up there. there, up there. Seven down here. Uh, you know, that, unless we are willing to engage the religion where it begins, there's not much we can do. Anybody can say anything they want to say about Muslims and about the Quran. Uh, and if you just haven't read it and are not 
uh, equipped to say it's not, it's not. For instance, 72 virgins, if, if you kill somebody, that's not in the Quran. <laughs> in fact, intercourse in heaven is not in the Quran. Marriage is. No matter how many women you marry, they're going to be your spouses in heaven, and you're going to be very happy together just uh, sitting on a couch and being served and treated. Uh, it doesn't say anything about having sex in heaven. Uh, the gardens is the word for heaven. In, uh, as, you, as it was pointed out, uh, it's a, a desert culture. So uh, garden, well-watered gardens, uh, not this arid sand, is what the gardens are waiting for you when you get to heaven. But a number of Islamic scholars have pointed out that most of these terrorists don't even know their own religion. They're ignorant of it, uh, no, any form of it. Uh, and, you know, if you are a practicing Muslim of any sort now, you don't prepare to go to heaven uh, by drinking and having lap dances the night before you bring on the horror of 9-11, as those stupid, mainly Saudi uh, killers did. They were, not, they were not even practicing Muslims. They were uh, Muslim haters. And, and they found out that Pew and Gallup have done extensive polls around the world that the militants are the most ignorant of their own religion. And the peaceful majority, vast majority, are the only ones who really pay attention to the Quran. Uh, Here. Don. Don Simmons. Uh, for seven or eight centuries, the uh, uh, Islam was the triumphant force in the world. And with the military success came artistic and scientific achievements as well. Came what? You have to... Artistic successes, scientific achievements. Um, for the, then the star faded, and for the last many centuries, um, it, the movement of world history has been dominated more by Western Christians. I just would ask, what, what were the factors that promoted that or brought that change about? Military, et cetera. Well, they were military, of course. Uh, as happens with peaceful religions when they start, uh, first they're persecuted by uh, opponents. Uh, and when anybody's martyred under that persecution, they're, they're made a great deal of. That was true of Christians and, uh, and of Muslims. And then they, they get some power to defend themselves. Uh, and then they get some kind of alliance with their former persecutors. That's what happened under Constantine when Christians uh, began to, went from equal opportunity to practice their religions uh, until then under Constantius when they were established, uh, the state religion. And when the, when the religion becomes the state religion, uh, that's always extremely dangerous because they start, everybody who's against them is against God. <laughs> they're, they're the devil. Uh, that was true of medieval Christian, uh, Christianity. Uh, that's why there were so many persecutions of dissident Christians and of Jews and others. Uh, so when the Muslims ascended this ladder of, to power and became a terrific per, imperial force, uh, the equal of medieval uh, church-state relations. Uh, they actually were far more tolerant of uh, other religions than Christianity was in the, sa in the same. Gibbon is a great student of uh, Islam, and he says, and many people have confirmed this, that 
Islam, at the height of its imperial power, when, as you say, it became a great artistic force, uh, as did Christianity in the 13th and 14th centuries, uh, it was far more tolerant of uh, other religions than Christianity had been in, at its peak. Uh, then, uh, in a whole series of fights, uh, including the Crusades, of course, the Christians tried to take back uh, the holy places from the Muslims, and they, they lost uh, for the most part. But, and in the fight that expanded the empire of Islam, uh, like most things, like medieval Christian empire, uh, it succumbed to various things, secular or uh, rival religions or just plain military force, you know. So finally, they were driven out that both Christians and Muslims have had at certain stages of their development. Then they start pulling back uh, and being forced to go back to more spiritual values of their original founding. So uh, there are then movements like St. Francis, uh, who, you know, who, who went over to Muslim territory hoping to convert uh, people, uh, not fight them, hoping to end that crusade. Uh, so it depends on what part of history you're going to dip into. One of the problems about how you interpret something like Christianity or so Islam is whether you're going to choose a, a historic period uh, and kind of reify that as the essence of the thing. That's why I think we have to go back to the sources. You have to go back to the New Testament to find out what Jesus wanted, which is mainly love and forgiveness of enemies, etc., and find out what uh, the Quran meant, which is mainly mercy. Mercy is the introductory entry to every surah. And every discussion ends, but remember, God is merciful. Mercy, there, uh, I haven't checked this, but my bet is that mercy is the most common uh, spiritual trait named in the Quran. I must check that. Okay. James Starkman, thank you for a fascinating uh, intellectual discussion. Uh, it seems to me that the essence of the misunderstanding or understanding of Islam boils down to the, the definition of the word infidel or non-believer. You have told us this morning that uh, uh, the, that definition is uh, the non-belief in polytheists. Uh, is there wiggle room in that interpretation to possibly include other religions, other sects, etc.? Not according to the Quran. Now, later... That, that's very explicit. Sure. He says, all the believers uh, are my believers. I've sent them all a message. All the believers in one God. Infidel means polytheist, plain and simple. Doesn't mean uh, other religion, and doesn't mean atheism, because that was not a problem then. Now, of course, atheists are a huge part of the population. Uh, the Quran never, question, never deals with that question, because there are so, so few atheists around. If, uh, and if they were there, they were indiscernibly there. Uh, no, his, his word for uh, unbelievers uh, is not infidels, but polytheists, believers and rival gods. Uh, and those are the only ones that are uh, condemned. Thank you for that great talk. I'm a practicing Muslim. It was great to have a person like you at the Carnegie Council. 
I just realized listening to you, for those of us practicing Muslims, it's very difficult to look and see. I think most of the West looks at the Muslims and judge Islam, and we just want them to differentiate between Islam and the Muslims of today. We feel that this is the darkest ages for Muslims. I, I wish if we were sitting during the time of Inquisition, we, do, we wouldn't be discussing ISIS, but something else. Um, I think we need people more like you to teach to the West, but also in my countries. I'm Turkish. Wahhabism, by the tribalism, by Arabic customs. So for those of us Muslims, and not all Muslims are Arabic, we feel that there is another challenge there. So not just here, but even in our own countries, we have a hard time showing true faith. And I studied at Harvard, and I just wanted to show uh, I studied these Ottoman uh, records. If I found out that the woman had prenups, like the Ottoman Muslim woman. So I went through all these court records in Egypt. So I, one of them was like this. Imagine, like, I'm Turkish, so these are like my ancestors. So this woman said, if you do not take me to Mecca two times a year, 10 dresses a year, like she put, like, I want 10 dresses a year, and you have to give me this much money, then I would divorce you. And I asked about dowry as well when I was studying Islamic studies. And mind you, I studied in this country. Why? Because back in Turkey, I wouldn't have that. So they said the dowry is half because the man needs to give his money to his children, whereas the woman retains the dowry. She's not supposed to. So at the end of the day, woman ends up with more money. There were so many more miraculous verses. It's just the faith has been hijacked from those that, you know. Um, so I just wanted to share. Oh, thank you. I, I... like. Uh, poetry to my ears listening to I notice you're not wearing a hijab. You don't have to be a Muslim. <laughs> well, I do pray, and in the Quran in my home is below my, you know, all of the books, but I pray Muslim women is that they have to cover up so much, according to different things. Uh, that's not in the Quran. The, the Quran says men and women should be modest and cover their privates. And women should cover their neck and shoulders. Uh, you know, that's like Paul saying that women have to wear uh, hats or something in, in the church. Uh, then, later on, as I say, that when the scholastic period of both religions comes along, you get more and more symbols through, through clothing for the men and for the women. In Christianity, we, we, we wrapped nuns as thoroughly as any burqa. The nuns who taught me in grade school, I couldn't tell whether they had hair, dress, a waist. Uh, the, the habit, as it was called, was designed to prevent you from ever thinking that uh, that ha could happen. Uh, and various other Christian communities have had various dress codes. Amish, uh, Mormon, uh, etc. You know, the dress code for Mormons is your baptismal underwear, uh, which is worn by men and women. But uh, the, uh, again, there's one verse that are, is taken as the whole meaning of the Quran, and there is one verse that's called the Baal verse. Baal, in that chapter does not refer to clothing. It says, when people come to petition uh, one of uh, Muhammad's wives, they should speak through a veil, a screen. It's variously translated. But it has nothing to do with her clothing. It has to do with the decorum of someone presenting himself to harem. Uh, and you know, first of all, it, it makes it 
uh, difficult to have any sexual communication. But uh, it's really a traffic law. One of the things is that Muhammad was allowed more wives than most. Uh, and when people came to petition, there had to be rules for uh, this. Uh, you know, which wife are you petitioning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one is that at the residence of Muhammad, it says unjust to say that it had to be wrapping up the woman so that she was sexually unidentifiable is like uh, taking as the essence of the New Testament the Dominican nun habit that I, that I was very familiar with. Helena? No. I'm Helena Finn. Uh, thank you, Professor Wills. And I want to thank Suna also for her comments throwing this into another whole here, perspective. Here. My question goes back as a follow-up to yours, uh, having to do with the arts. The Muslim world, and I'm a former diplomat, I've lived in a number of majority Muslim countries, has produced some of the most magnificent architecture, the Taj Mahal, the Suleimaniye in Istanbul, many other such edifices, decorative arts, poetry, calligraphy, and it's documented by, actually it's a Harvard guy, historian, it's documented that around the world the Wahhabis have been destroying the calligraphy. Uh, don't uh, deface anything having to do with a fellow believer. Uh, and if he says, protect churches and protect synagogues, as you would protect mosques, obviously that does, doesn't mean destroy. <laughs> Uh, work of other believers. Uh, so that, that has no possible relationship to the Quran. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Ahadur Polash, a CUNY student at City Tech. You have Tech. to talk a little louder for me. I'm old. My name is uh, Ahadur Polash, a CUNY student at City Tech, and I'm also a fellow Muslim. So I would like to uh, say, Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah wa barakatuh. You have to be much more distinct and loud. Which uh, I'd like to uh, address everyone with, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, which means, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Um, my uh, first question to you, Professor, was... Um, one question. We're running out okay. of time. Well, just fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I chose the best um, one. Right. Have you ever uh, have you ever um, spoke or have had a conversation with um, any Islamic scholars? Uh, yeah, correspondence, but that not uh, face to face. Why? You think they would disagree with what I've been telling you? Uh, no, I wouldn't um, say that because um, everything you've said, I've heard my scholars also say the exact same thing, except for some, like uh, four. Um, Back, uh, before that, many of the companions and Muslims had more than four wives. So when that verse came, many of the companions had to divorce many of their wives, and they were only allowed to keep up to four. But in case of uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, his wife, uh, Allah said that his wives weren't just any regular woman. They were considered the mother of the believers, all of them. And that's why no one was actually allowed to marry them. So that's why he was them uh, as wives, and it was only um, for him. And after that, he never um, married anyone, and he never actually divorced anyone. Well, the Quran says, yes, that he did have many wives, and that he was allowed to. Uh, it also said that, remember, getting close to Muhammad was getting close to God. And so a lot of people wanted to be uh, associated with him in many ways. Uh, they all had to boast of their intimacy, the companions, the people who, who went on these, the uh, journey from Mecca to Medina. Uh, they, they had great force. And that was true of the wives. And it was so much an honor uh, to be married to Muhammad, 
that some of the later wives he took were the widows of the companions that had fought with him and died with him. And he took them in almost as an act of uh, royal prestige. Uh, these are people to be honored uh, in every way, and including uh, marriage to him. And it's called marriage uh, in the Quran, and it says, don't think other people get these uh, uh, exceptional things. The, the others are told, what, what's interesting is it says, you can have four wives if you're able to support them. Uh, if you can't, uh, don't do it. Uh, because that will make you liable to uh, exploitation or corruption or whatever to try to get enough to support them. Uh, said, in other words, don't use marriage as a way to increase your fortune. Uh, unless you have enough, you, you're not eligible to marry. Last question, John. You've had your hand up for a long time. Uh, John Richardson. My question is about the, is there any clue or guidance in the Quran as to secular, secularism, um, or, or does it support, you know, re religious or something like that? That's my question. I, just as a, per a person who knows nothing about the Quran or anything like that, I do think from a secular point of view that the clothing, the hijab or the burqa, wonderful things. I hope that they are widely used in this country because they hide the tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> or perforated nostrils and everything else. Uh, no, no, he doesn't. Uh, if by secularism you mean non-religious, uh, he doesn't address that because I said there were no atheists in that world. Uh, they were, if they were against the Muslim population, the only thing that they would know is polytheism. And that's not secularism. Secularism is uh, fun practical atheism. That is, that is the, the law is atheist in the sense of not recognizing any religion. Uh, not establishing any religion. That, that was inconceivable in the 7th century. Well, I thank you for your insights, for helping us to begin this conversation, and it was really a privilege to have you here. And his book is available for you. Thank you. Don't, don't move. Thank you.